Okay, this is uh, Mohammed Khan, and uh, just to give you a little my background is uh, I've been in the payment industry for 31 years, but uh, I've been evangelist for mobile payments for the last 14 years. So I've been on this journey for a long time. So it's really good to see that uh, we got uh, life back in the NFC, thanks to Apple Pay. And uh, through Apple Pay, I think uh, there are a couple of things really happened. It's not only NFC has been given a life, but the whole tokenization and mobile payments, all those things. So we've got a great panel to talk about those things, what's in front of us. And uh, so I'm going to let uh, these guys introduce themselves. Please. Okay. Sebastian. So I'm, I'm. My name is Sebastian Cano. I uh, I run the North American operation for Jamalto. Uh, I've been with uh, Jamalto a little more than 20 years, uh, in different areas of the world. I've been running uh, Jamalto operations in uh, South America, in Europe, in Spain, in France. That's my background. Great, uh, Jeff Miles. I'm with NXP Semiconductors. Uh, I head up the mobile transactions worldwide, so everything related to the secure element in uh, NFC sales for NXP. My name is Hans Reiskies, and I'm the co-founder and the head of the Customer Solutions Center at Sequent. Sequent is a trusted services provider. Um, in the old language that we call them TSMs, and the new language we call them token service providers. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and um, we're based in Silicon Valley, a um, five-year-old company. My name is Brian Semkew. I'm the CEO of Carta Worldwide. We do two things. We are a processor for issuing banks. And secondly, we are an, a tokenization service provider. So we are a, a digital um, enablement service. Uh, and our claim to fame would be some of the very first HCA transactions in the world were performed on our platform. So we have a long pioneering view of, of, of this business and our our view, even at the outset, as we were an issuing processor, is we believe that um, technol or that transactions would be mobile, and uh, as an architecture, that's how we have viewed our our growth and uh, see our future. All right. So thanks for the introduction. So I think we've been hearing about mobile payments for quite a while. It's been coming, and you know, as I mentioned, 14 years into that thing as well. But just over the last one year, there are two very important developments that have taken place. One is Apple Pay very recently, the other one is SCE. So I would like to ask the panelists here that between the two, which will have the bigger impact on making the mobile payments real and critical mass? Okay. Shall I go first? Yeah, please. Okay. So, <clears throat> well, first, I'm sorry, I would probably not compare exactly uh, Apple Pay and HCE. Um, Apple Pay is a, is a product that just uh, has been recently recently launched uh, to perform payment. HC is a specification, so um, it can certainly enable uh, uh, mobile payment in the future. It's an interesting uh, uh, technology, an interesting alternative. It's not deployed, to my knowledge, anywhere in the world, at large scale. So uh, I would really put them on the same at the same level. It's, it's uh, still a very interesting question, and I definitely believe Apple Pay is uh, is making a, a a big difference um, in the uh, in, in as as a, as a as a as an offer for uh, many reasons for different reasons for market, marketing reasons obviously um, anything that Apple does is uh, noticed uh, in noticed and and is going to attract attention um, for the way uh, the the solution has been implemented a few of the product decisions that uh, Apple made have been extremely elegant and efficient obviously the authentication through the fingerprint reader is is a, is a very good way to solve a problem uh, for authentication of the user um, um, the enrollment uh, process through the iTunes cards is definitely a, a huge asset that Apple has been able to uh, to leverage um, but most importantly, I think it's on the technical implementation that Apple Pay is setting a, is setting a standard by uh, validating an implementation that, uh, in fact, is not an innovation that has been around for many, many years, which is uh, to use a tamper-proof piece of silicone uh, to store credentials into the device. Uh, this uh, is something that has been around for uh, years and deployed in uh, uh, billions of cars, and definitely uh, Apple Pay has set, uh, has set the standard uh, uh, of security at the highest possible level. Uh, I think uh, the whole industry has to uh, pay attention to that. So in this, for these reasons, I believe definitely Apple Pay is a, is a, is a, a strong milestone in the, uh, in the deployment of mobile payments. 
Great. Jeff, you have a Great, yeah. So um, uh, I'll also duck the direct hit or criticism on one or the other. And I would, I would actually say both are critical for the sort of moving mobile payments ahead. I think first and foremost, um, Apple Pay is simply consumers can use it. Uh, the challenge in the last 10, 15 years has not been always technology. It's been how do consumers get it in their hands? How do they use it? Most of you may know um, McDonald's has been able to take an NFC mobile phone for well over 10 years now. Uh, the problem has been very few consumers have had that on their wallet. So I think from that perspective and already the traction they're getting, I think that to me is, is perhaps what's most important to add on. Obviously, great security, all of those kinds of things, very, very well set up. And I think the, the consumer value pr proposition is perhaps even more important in terms of protecting your security and privacy and, and those things. Um, and, and maybe a bit controversial even within our company, I think HCE is also a very positive sign for the industry. I think first it, it endorses NFC as, as really from the whole opt-in user intent. It, it really is an elegant way for you to pay or to do something on a secure transaction. Um, but for me what's important about HCE is it's the concept of opening up uh, the system to allow people to come develop wallets, put the right user experience and to a certain extent let the best wallet win. Uh, rather than what much of the industry has been where we're holding and blocking and you're sort of limited by where you buy, what phone you buy, what network you're on. So um, that would be my, why I think they're both extremely Great. important. And we have a very political, politically <laughs> correct panelist. This is terrible. It's just, it's just a start. This this is, come on. I mean, so, so bigger the organization. Big bigger organizations can be more political. Yes, little organizations, we can be more controversial. So I think HCE tokenization at the end of the day is the long-term winner. Okay, because standards-based, scale-based, developer-based, consumer choice-based solutions inevitably win. However, what we are going to remember is Apple Pay. Apple Pay was the disruption that moved the whole ecosystem forward. Um, that was the big stone in the pond that created even bigger ripples. I think when we compare Apple Pay to Google Wallet and to SoftCard Wallet, both SoftCard and Google Wallet had, had plunked their stone in the water, but the effect on the, on the remaining industry was small. The effect on Apple Pay is enormous. Okay, I would say we're gonna have 2,000 banks in the United States signed up for Apple Pay by the end of the year. Okay, that is a lot of very slow, conservative companies moving very, very quickly. Okay, to get 2,000 banks to do anything in six months, I would have said is impossible, okay? <laughs> You cannot underestimate the effect, the disruptive effect of getting the industry moving forward that Apple Pay has created. You can hate it, you can think secure elements suck, whatever. All banks now have a 1.0 mobile payment strategy and that's Apple Pay. The fun is gonna be what is 2.0, okay? But 1.0, it's done. 1.0 for banks is Apple Pay. Saying it a slightly different way, I very much agree with your point of view. <laughs> okay. <laughs> less, less controversial. But, but um, you know, the way I would characterize what was going on in the industry is, um, at, you know, before the race started, you see uh, a lot of athletes warming up and jogging around the track and doing stretches. And those were called pilots. Then the gun went off, and now the race has begun. And the battle is really the battle for the consumer. Um, is going to be fought by many companies, not just Apple and Apple's competitors and, and retailers and, uh, and network providers. And the battle for the consumer is, is now raging. And um, from my view though, uh, as we process on, on uh, currently on SIM cards, on embedded secure elements and HCE, I think the uh, outside of the United States where we do most of our work so um, we're not that well known in the US yet but uh, certainly in rest of world we are and I think the early action is very much HCE oriented the numbers of banks that are are moving quickly to develop and to digitize their uh, and and uh, digitally enable their current credit card portfolios is is quite high in rest of world so um, I, I would say that um, uh, basically exactly what you said, but that the long-term winner uh, is something that's open. Open always beats closed in every industry. So, by the way, I appreciate to be candid. I, that makes it a lot more easier for people to understand rather than 
hidden aspect of things. <laughs> also, just on that path of this, uh, I'm going to play on Apple Pay and AC a bit. I think and what I'm hearing is the scalability became easier with Apple Pay. And I thought that was also was the, one of the driver of AC was scalability. So can you touch on the business model effect of the two? And uh, just, uh, just in a manner that, uh, are we going to solve the business model problem? Because whenever we talk about the NFC mobile payment, it always got stuck onto the business model, whether it's for the issuers or whether it's for the merchants or whether it's, it's uh, for the MNOs. So please, anyone who wants to take it? I'll, I'll take a shot at that. Yeah. So, I mean, what you, I think what you're really saying is, is that there isn't enough money in small value transactions. So people think that NFC is just coffee and donuts. And that's not what's happening in many other countries. Right now, high value, pin secure transactions are taking place using mobile payments. So in Spain, for example, you're tapping your phone and you're buying, your, and the restaurant is coming to you with a POS, and you're tapping your phone and you're spending 120 euros because it's pin secured. So as EMV enters into the US, you're going to see contactless payments go way beyond coffee and donuts, and uh, even uh, uh, to uh, processing uh, QR codes and having pin secure transactions on, on the internet. So I see thousands of dollars worth of transactions. Who wants to type in their, their credit card number and all that sort of stuff when you have a, uh, uh, a provision phone, it's now secured, and now you can take a picture of a QR code and perform a high value pin secure transaction, totally el eliminating card not present transactions on the internet. I think the beginning of contactless payments is way, is just started and goes way beyond coffee and donuts. Absolutely. Well, I think, I think where you're kind of, what I, I hear you saying is, and you know, to be frank, right, for the, for the community of secure element folks, there's a lot of you out there. Okay, I see you. You know, we had a problem with the M&O business model. M&Os were the big deployers of secure elements. Um, unfortunately, that, those solutions were not cheap for the M&O. That made a business model that was not cheap to the banks that tried to use those secure elements. And we got stalled, right? And HCE and tokenization was a way to solve that problem. I think, ultimately, HC, you know, we had a not easy, not cheap solution with secure elements. And now we have a not easy, not cheap solution with tokenization. I mean, HCE tokenization is not free. It is gosh darn expensive, okay? And HCE tokenization is not simple. It is gosh darn hard, okay? It's so hard, we don't, we're not, as an industry, we're not really ready to do hundreds of millions of tokenized transactions per month, okay? We don't have the risk models on all of, you know, that kind of scale yet. So, like I said, I think HCE tokenization is the long-term winner. I don't think it's, it doesn't fundamentally solve, I would actually go the other way too. We said HC tokenization was gonna get rid of the dependency of the M&O. Those bad M&Os, terrible. Now you're dependent on the operating system vendor, okay? iOS has to support HCE. You ever wanna do HCE on an iPhone? Guess who you are now dependent on? Apple, okay? We've shifted the dependency from one dictator to another dictator. Now the question is which one's more benevolent? Okay, is Apple our benevolent dictator? Is, uh, is Android our benevolent dictator? Uh, maybe, right? They play a little better in the sandbox with others, unless you're an advertising company. Okay, so I think, I, I think there's the people that simplify this and say, oh, HCE solves all problems. N -n no, very difficult, very complex, very expensive, and we are dependent on some benevolent dictators to do implementation. Good. Anyone else wants yeah. to take yeah. on that? So just to be, you, so you, you just said secure elements suck and Apple's a dictator. So no, I'm just saying. <laughs> just, I'm, I'm just, I'm saying. Just that, keeping that, track. It's and, equal you know. suckiness, equal suckiness. Yeah, okay, all right, okay. Just, just, just. Equal e suckiness. I support I, both, that's so. A, that's I, a real term. Our so. job sucks too. I mean, yeah. we have to support both of those solutions. <laughs> yeah. Think of that. And suckiness on your iPhone MasterCard spell tricked, check. Yeah, MasterCard okay, tricked us. We, we support the, the secure element specification, spent millions of dollars, and now we have to support yeah. millions of dollars to support See, the HD specification. So, I mean, we're the loser. I think the Khan's question, my, my view on it would be, um, I think what needs to happen, and if you look at it is, it's kind of in line with what we've been saying is, 
the companies that need to do what they do really well, and that sounds a bit odd, but I'll, I'll use an example, and it, very much like Brian said, in other parts of the country, you're seeing successful implementations. We're working with some of the Chinese OEMs right now where it is essentially an open secure element concept. So it's similar to HCE, allows you to access it, really reduces the friction, and really reduces from the SE because most of the OEMs we work with there don't want to be in the payments business. They don't want to be in the landlord business of renting out space. Uh, they view the secure element like a camera, like Wi-Fi or GPS. It's a feature on my phone that drives more use cases and better things I can do. And one particular partnership, it's not even payment related. Uh, it's with Transit, it's with Alipay, and with a customer called Oppo. And it's actually working very well. So we see where this is going to be successful is where these companies can do they, what they do well. Apple does a lot of things really, really well. Uh, at and does some things really well. MasterCard, Google, et cetera. I see where we've had the biggest challenges when those entities tried to jump in and do something else that they don't necessarily do really well. And, and for me, that's where, like I said, I, I hope that, as Brian said, the race, the quickest way to catch up is to bring in the right partners to, to deliver the right product. So, Sebastian? <clears throat> yeah, um, no, my only comment would be that uh, I think uh, this, this, this ecosystem is in its uh, infancy right now, so it's definitely way too early to, say, uh, to call winners and losers, uh, to say that telcos don't have a value proposition that would help this ecosystem, that uh, HC is the solution to every problem, or that barcodes are maybe that one, yes. But for the rest, uh, <laughs> for, the, for the rest, I think it's, it's, there's still a, a lot of... Uh, um, players that need to work together to, to bring a value proposition. There is one player, a very strong player, a powerful player, who made an outstanding proposal to the market. It's Apple Pay, very good. Uh, you have 60, I think 60 plus percent of the smartphones out there which are uh, Android based. Uh, you still need a solution to address this 60%, and you may have solutions that could address both. Let's not discard that off the bat. So um, I think. Uh, uh, the value proposition of the MNOs, as I said, uh, is certainly not something in stone right now. Um, I know, um, in particular, the soft card initiative has been um, going on now, uh, active, operative for a year, and uh, they have struggled to uh, gather banks. I think they are uh, working on their value proposition and certainly can uh, appeal to more uh, uh, banks in the future. Uh, HC with uh, tokenization, because HC by itself is, is just not enough, but with a good tokenization implementation can certainly uh, be a good alternative. Uh, let's see what are the first mass deployments out there. I, I, I don't know of any today, but so certainly uh, banks are working on it and, and payment networks will certainly help in the way. Uh, this is still the very beginning. Great. One thing I would say, I hope that invent, infancy, which has been going on for at least 12 years, I've been waiting for, <laughs> hopefully one day is grow up. But I do see that thing is some growth through the Apple Pay because it has broken some uh, mold out of it. And it, uh, if, uh, if I touch on it, summarize on that aspect of it is, uh, somewhere or other, Apple Pay is able to make a business model work between the issuers, between the MNOs as well. I don't know what they have. Uh, as, uh, established with MNOs, or apparently they are allowing that thing, which was not the case before or so. So something has moved forward. That's, uh, I'm hoping that's, but I also heard that AC is, may not be the answer for everything, but let's hope that there is something because we need to take care of the Android as well. Uh, next uh, breach of questions, uh, more in the advantages. Uh, going to this NFC mobile, is that good for consumers? Is that good for merchants? Is that good for issuers? or for all of them. Can you give a little more sure. flavor to it? I, I can give a really biased opinion yes. if you want. <laughs> um, I, I, I think, and it's been said in a lot of the different panels, um, I, I think that there are many different great value propositions in payment. And someone mentioned earlier uh, about Uber. And, and if you think of that, if you've had the chance, it's a great service. It works really well. And payment is completely frictionless. It's, it's a great system. I get my receipt after. I don't pull out a card. I think it's a great application in that particular area. But um, I think that's not necessarily a, in, in the end all. I think NFC has great value in terms of High level security, it's on proven systems that have been in place for many years. The smart card industry as a whole, and what the reason we're all going to chip cards is it does reduce fraud, 
and it does cause a much better situation on the back end. Consumers don't care that much. As, love, as much as I'd love it that my kids go to school and say my dad sells Secure Elements and they're really proud of it, um, <laughs> that's not what happens. That's not um, it. No, it's not. I, I, I've given them presentations and everything. It just doesn't work. Yeah, everything. Um, um, but, but I do think um, there are big advantages for NFC and the use of a Secure Element clearly because it's an existing infrastructure. If you go to intent, there's nothing like that. You know this is what it is. Same thing on high transactions, et cetera. So from my perspective, absolutely. But it doesn't mean it has to be everything. I think too often we set expectations for a wallet. And I think that's the same thing I worry about Apple Pay is that it's done amazing things. It doesn't solve every one of your problems yet. Mm -hmm. So it's still going to be a continuing evolution, as you said, 2.0, 3.0. It's going to get continue to get more use, more value. So we need to have the right expectations. Your wallet won't disappear when you buy your new iPhone 6. Um, but it is a step closer. All right. Anyone else? Yeah. So <clears throat> again, if it's well implemented, certainly uh, the mobile web wallet is, is a fantastic uh, proposition to the market, to all the players uh, in the market. Um, <clears throat> Here in the US, m most of us are currently paying with a Mac Stripe, with a magnetic Stripe card. So uh, a correct implementation of a mobile wallet means certainly an EMV grade of security that everyone can enjoy in the US. Uh, uh, the American consumer could discover the security level of EMV maybe in the phone before they even uh, have it in, in a physical card. Um, also, uh, a uh, contactless NFC, contactless transaction is fast and easy. That's something that should uh, benefit the consumers, their merchants, because it should reduce transaction time at the point of sale, and, and e eventually uh, the banks, because it's going to be more, more um, transactions. Um, again, it has to be implemented well. Uh, um, Apple has a good solution, again, with the fingerprint reader. Uh, we can think of other solutions. Uh, many countries where NFC payments are deployed with physical cards, um, uh, those countries uh, set uh, uh, a threshold uh, and under which uh, uh, no PIN or no con uh, user authentication method is required uh, to make the transaction time even faster and, and easier. Uh, that's that's uh, unbeatable. So um, that's, that's certainly good. And finally, probably the most important point is that the mobile uh, phone is a, an interactive tool for the merchant and the bank to uh, 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 have an interactive exchange with the consumer. You, I can think of, and, and again here, uh, it, it opens uh, endless possibilities, you know, in-store uh, promotions, uh, coupon uh, uh, redeeming, you know, uh, these coupons that are in your kitchen drawer, well, now you have it with you when you pay. Um, so this is in, in, an, inc an, inc an incredibly uh, large number of possibilities. and. Um, I don't think we should come to the conclusion that this, is, this means the end of the physical card. Um, actually, I think the physical card and, and the mobile wallet can fuel each other's uh, success. So uh, obviously, I mean, most of the people in the audience know that there is an EMV migration that has st started now in the US. So most of the uh, POS terminals will be upgraded to support EMV in the next uh, uh, few months until uh, October 15. Uh, you, will, uh, you will have the opportunity, in the, merchants will have the opportunity in the US to make the right decision because most of the POS terminals that are coming to market right now uh, are going to be NFC capable. So obviously they will need to make the decision to turn the NFC feature on, that's another debate, but certainly you, this is a good example where the physical card is helping the deployment of mobile payment by building, solving the infrastructure problem. Uh, and I think it works the other way around. Uh, American users will start to have the uh, contactless experience probably first with their phone, with their Apple Pay device or with a soft card device. Um, they might expect the same uh, user friendliness with their physical card. So as you know, we uh, also offer a dual interface technology and the contactless, obviously you don't have the interaction that is possible like with a phone, but you certainly can have the very fast experience of tapping and paying. Uh, in, in, in the physical card itself. So I think the two will really um, fuel each other and I don't think physical cards will disappear anytime soon. I mean, I can add a short comment yep. and I'll just precursor Keep by saying yep. my Twitter handle is NFC guy. So this is probably going to be a positive comment for NFC. Uh, feel free to tweet me for things you don't like that I say. Um, um, I think, you know. Can, can, can you give your Twitter address? N NFC guy, that's my Twitter. So I'm going to be slightly pro NFC right now. 
Um, so ultimately, I mean, nine years ago was my first panel on, on this whole topic, and the conversation was, where are the NFC phones? Eight years ago, it was, where are the NFC phones? Seven years ago, it was, where was the NFC phones? Six years ago, five years ago, oh, oh, four years ago, wait a minute, phones are starting to show up. Okay, do banks want to do this? Do banks want to do this? Okay, so the conversation shifted. I think from an NFC perspective, it's time to take a victory lap. Okay, good news, NFC is going to be in smartphones. Okay, and good news, it's going to be accessible to app developers. Okay, and by the way, you can use NFC to talk to existing infrastructure that are readers. Great news. I think the best thing we can do is stop making false fights between BLE and NFC. I thought, uh, actually, the Google guy did a good job of kind of disp dispelling that artificial fight. Okay, and let's get out of the way and let's let the app developers delight us. Right? Let's get out of the way and let them, now that they have this resource, let's see something beautiful. Apple Pay has, is the high watermark right now. But that's not going to be the best solution on the planet. Trust me. There's a lot of very talented people. We're going to see some amazing things. So I think NFC as a short distance radio, victory lap. It's going to be in phones. Great. Now the question is, I'm really excited to see what we get from this. My, my only comment on this is that from a data point of one, which is myself, and I hate carrying around my wallet with all its cards in it. And I can tell you now that in the last few months, I have completely turned off. And I only go to places that accept NFC and mobile payments. My wallet is in my trunk of my car, and I just go around with my phone. And I choose places to shop that accept my phone. So the merchants that don't have it aren't getting my business. And that is one data point. That's me. But I think I'm representative of quite a few people that would have that attitude coming quite quickly. Yeah, and, and just yeah, go ahead, Jeff. The problem, Hans and I have been doing that for nine years. And it's, exactly. It's, Where have you been? It's been tough. Well, you know how long you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, you at McDonald's? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Well, I, 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 I just got to Subway <laughs> like last week. Well, I live in Toronto. They just got 40,000 readers in Subway. Uh, <laughs> Thank God. I, I live in Toronto, and we're, we're, we're ready in Toronto. Yeah, yeah. You, Canada, Tim Hortons, you're good. Tim Hortons, second Here in the U.S., we just all going to eat at Subway only, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. You touched, Brian, you touched on one thing very important. You mentioned earlier that NFC was being used with PIN in Spain. Yes. So that means NFC can work with PIN. Yes, absolutely. Why we continue to hear that thing NFC and PIN go, don't go together and merchants, they don't like it and all that. Can you put a little? I, I don't know why that is out there because it's not true. NFC and PIN absolutely works together. So all you need is the merchant acquirer to accept that form of right. uh, authorizations. So it's not the NFC, which is the no. culprit. It is something else then. Yeah, you, you tap your phone. It, it, it goes over the threshold of, of, of no security or no right. PIN, and it, and it looks for a PIN. You put in a PIN, job done. Right, right. So I think this takes us into the little bit of flavor on the merchant side. We see a lot of different merchants accepting NFC. And then there comes out to be you know, a couple of fun merchants like CVS and Rite Aid said, we're not going to accept them. NFC because it's too expensive, or Apple Pay is too expensive. We'll let them figure it out and what the business model between the two would be. But let's say tens of millions of consumers, they're enabled with Apple Pay, and they are paying at all those locations, whether Survey or many other vending machines and many tier three or three merchants and everything. You think all these tier one merchants, they finally moved forward? Do you see that? Yep. Definitely, yes. I mean, I think. Uh, I feel terrible for currency. They got caught in a, just an, an absolutely bad timing situation. Almost as bad as soft card slash ISIS that you know, was also kind of bad luck, okay? Currency, um, you know, they're, they're in field trials, right? This really shouldn't be a public disclosure of their product yet, okay? And you had the new high water mark of mobile payments come out with all the glitz and glory. And as we are all consumers, we, take, we accept that high water mark and then we look down on everything else. And I think currency just got, just, it's getting clobbered from that perspective, right? Is it going to be better than Apple Pay? That is the new standard. They didn't write that in the specification that they designed a year ago, okay? They wrote a specification that didn't say, be better than Apple Pay a year ago, okay? But that is the new reality. And so I think the word or is extremely difficult for consumers. You can, you know, not being able to do something, not being able to make a payment my way is a dangerous place for merchants to, to stand on moral grounds. Okay, now obviously currency is ultimately about lowering the transaction costs 
of transactions, right? There's one person inside a merchant that cares about how much it costs to accept your money. Cash, check, credit, debit, gift card. 90, 99% of all the employees at the merchant care about selling you stuff. One guy cares about the transaction fee. And I think ultimately, currencies will, currency will lose that momentum of trying to affect the transaction rate using mobile as an inflection point. I just don't think you can control mobile enough to use that as an inflection point. Right. Jeff? Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with Hans. And, and I think part of the challenge, in addition to timing or any of the other things, it's the assumption that by turning something off, I've, I'm going to give myself some ground. That, that generally is not a good business model. If I had to turn something off and prevent it, and therefore my product is successful, because if you look at what we know of today, I would, I would never want to underestimate Walmart and all their partners. But from what we've heard, to assume consumers are going to put their bank account information, um, that they're going to use a barcode, which is not always the most elegant user solution. Try Southwest at the San Jose Terminal when you lose connectivity. Um, it's, it's, I, see, I see some challenges in that. And let's remember, they sh shut it off to do that. But if I use my credit card, I still have the same fee. So it's, to me, that's, it's not starting on the right way to go about it. I still think currency has a great opportunity if you, or, if you offer me as a consumer a better value, value proposition. If I go into Walmart and by signing up with my bank account and by going through and using their wallet, I get extra promotions, I get discount, I get rebates. Uh, Discover had a great program for a while with the cash back. Um, that was one thing that Costco was successful at doing in the U.S. where they did block um, a certain card, and they, I think they've had reasonable success. So if you offer the right value proposition, I think it can work. But from what I've heard so far, I, it, it doesn't feel good to say that's, that's been the response. So. so choices should be given to the consumers. Uh, yeah, that's absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Walmart can stop accepting American Express. It's only 4 or 5% of their total transactions. Why do they support something so that's a failure? 4% of all your transactions at American Express, and you still accept it? I mean, that, wouldn't that, we would call that an enormous failure. Well, the reason why they accept it is some people actually want to pay with it, yeah. right? And at the end of the day, you want to take their money, I, right? I, I have no comment on that further, but uh, <laughs> let's, let's move to the technology side of things. Uh, Android. Now, we have seen what's coming out with the iOS and iPhone, secure element play, tokenization play, and is very simple consumer experience. How do you see this thing is going to be played out on Android platform? Let's start with Jeff. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, well, uh, Sebastian, yeah, please. No, we, yeah, well, I think we addressed it briefly, so I'm, I'm, <clears throat> I'm not going to repeat myself. I believe, again, this is a very early uh, stage in the game. So uh, if my estimation is right, I think uh, uh, US uh, carriers have deployed more than 70 or 80 million NFC-capable phones with uh, secure elements in it. Uh, I mean, this is a fantastic accessible market now for... 70, 80 industry. million here in the U.S.? In the U.S. Wow. alone. So, I mean, this is a fantastic uh, base to, to play with, right? Uh, offer um, a solution that is available today that, offer, that meets the most uh, uh, stringent security standards. And... Um, well, uh, I think these guys need to find a value proposition that is appealing to the banks. Um, I think the infrastructure problem will be solved. To your previous question, I think the position of some merchants, not all, some merchants, is unsustainable. And anyway, most of them will deploy NFC POS capable terminals in the coming months because they are migrating their infrastructure to support EMV. So, Game is on. HC is an, is an additional interesting alternative. Um, it moves the complexity a bit away from the device into the back end uh, because you need to manage security in a different way. It's not necessarily a magic wand, but it's another way to tackle the same problem. So options are there, Good. And, and I think it's definitely a, an so exciting I got time to for one and a half industry. minute to answer the question. Uh, please, I you can go short. So, right. um, I'm not even going to go with Securement and NFC because it's the best and NXP ships the best in that. But um, uh, to me, it's really simple. The Android answer has to be, and I'm going to use um, Aria as the example, the cards uh, for your room, your room key, right? That's also an NXP product. Um, that should be really easy for them to develop an Android app and an iOS app. And it should be very easy for them as an option to say, as a loyalty or whatever it is, do you want to add your card? And if you do and you need NFC and you need a secure element, 
You can't make ARIA go make a deal with every mobile network operator, every OEM across the board. So to me, we have to, and, and the, as you said, the phones are there, the technology is there. It needs to be easy because that's what's going to incent them. It's a great value proposition, especially in Vegas, to be able to check so, in. So what I'm hearing, no matter what, consumers should have a consistent experience. Yes. Simple as that. So with that, I'm going to open up uh, to the audience. We got 10 minutes for any question you have. Otherwise, I got further questions. Please. Steven Sprague of Rivets Corp. My um, past, past life was um, running one of the companies that drove trusted computing in the Wintel platform. And I find surprising on this panel that there's no conversation at all yet on the fact that the 1.2 billion secure elements in Wintel that are exposed now in Windows 8.1 and will be much more broadly exposed in Windows 10, um, which now that you're starting to modernize access to the payment system, things like HCE, secure element-based transactions, there's another player with an enormous installed base and in e-commerce, the majority of the dollar value of transactions passes through that platform. So I'd love to hear the panel's comments on what you think the role is of secure elements, and trust execution within uh, Wintel machines that all of us use to shop for everything for Christmas. Good question. Yeah, please. No, no, go ahead. Anyone go ahead. wants yeah. to address yeah, that? I think the, I, it's absolutely, and I think Apple Pay, one of the hidden features that's really, really powerful is it, whatever you want to call it, device present, card present, whatever, the capability to do that, as you said, it's been there for a while. I think what's key, though, is making it easily accessible for both the payments sort of card, so that, that card you choose to use, and then on your device to do it. I think it's, it potentially has almost a bigger impact than the physical payment side, so I'm a big supporter of it. Thanks. Great. And by the way, and I, I do agree that for the e-commerce transaction, the industry should look into yep. how to apply that standard onto the Wintel environment. Yes, please. Yeah, so this comment may be directed towards Hans. And by the way, I'm also an NFC guy, so here's my victory lap. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> but uh, seriously, uh, I really appreciate your candor in talking about the complexity of an HCE tokenization process. And tokenization is being thrown around in this conference and at other places in a lot of ways with there's many different flavors and forms of tokenization and yet we're using the same terminology to kind of describe all of it as one thing. But for the benefit of the audience, can you articulate a little bit more clearly about the HCE tokenization proposition, what makes it so difficult, or what do you see has to be overcome from an infrastructure standpoint in order to get past the difficulty and get it actually into broad scale implementation? I'm going to request another view first and then I'll come to okay, Hans. Okay, okay. Who wants to take that question Let first? Me. I can give it a try. <laughs> no. uh, well, I don't think it's that hard. Tokenization? The, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> you got your answer. Thank you. No, I, I mean, I think we should start with the assumption that uh, uh, most software-based uh, security have a way around. I mean, there is certainly a consensus among security experts that HC by itself, the secure zone of HC, that sandbox, is certainly hackable. So you need, you need tokens because you need to consider that at some point in time, there will be ways to capture the secrets, the credentials that are stored to validate a transaction into that uh, software in the device. Um, so the question is, how do you make these tokens, uh, or part of the token, or the keys associated with it, uh, dynamic enough, and you make, it, you make the change and the update of the content of these uh, credentials, security elements, uh, dynamic enough, and change them frequently enough um, to, uh, to keep this as a robust enough uh, security solution. And when you deploy that out of millions or tens of millions of devices, it's not impossible, it's just a bit complex. I think that's it. Yeah, Hans, you want to get yeah, I mean, why? I, I mean, I would actually be curious, like, how many people heard the word tokenization for the first time from Apple? Like, I mean, you saw there, and they all said tokenization. You're like, ooh, that sounds interesting, right? Um, uh, I would say to, to, your, to your point, I mean, we are, there was the word NFC. I don't know if you've heard, but that solved all problems on the planet. Okay, then we have the word wallet. That has solved all problems on the planet. And now you are going to be sick of the word tokenization. Okay, 
we're going to be talking, tokenization is going to be part of the payments ecosystem for the next 20 years. So if you don't like the word now, find a way to make peace, okay? <laughs> this, is, this is fundamental change to the payments ecosystem at all levels and in all form factors and all types. So to, to and, and, and MasterCard and Visa recognize this, and to make it even more difficult for all of us trying to keep up, they reached back into 2005, where very, very innovative people figured out how to make contactless cards work, okay? And we used to call that dynamic card data, and they now call it tokenization, tokenization okay? So MasterCard and Visa take something that, we, that Khan and a bunch of very brilliant people did in 2005, and they call it tokenization, okay? Post facto. And everything we're doing forward, we're calling tokenization, too. And by the way, there's e-commerce tokenization, too. Okay, so, this, uh, so I think to the, the question of why is this hard, very simply, we're talking about putting um, credit card data in Android phone memory. Okay, if there's a CISO in the room, they just passed out. Okay, putting credit card data, debit card data, bank card data in Android phone memory will stop every conversation at a bank. Okay, there's no possible way it can be allowed. Okay, so. That is the challenge that MasterCard and Visa have attempted to solve by embracing the idea of, well, maybe we can, we can limit its use so that if it's breached, the bad guys can't make bad transaction with it. Like, make it one-time use, okay? Um, make it location dependent so it can only work in Vegas and not Siberia, okay? Make it so it can only be accepted through a contactless reader. It can't be put on a mag stripe. Okay, that is what is hard about tokenization is we're gonna put, we're gonna, we're gonna you know, violate all good common sense and we're gonna put payment card data in phone memory and then we're gonna find ways to mitigate the damage so that when those tokens are hacked, which I guarantee you they're gonna get hacked, the bad guys can't do anything with them. Okay, now you convince the CISOs at banks to sign off to that. That's why it's hard. Anyway, jury is out there. Let's see what we will know for we, a year from now. We support it. I mean, I'm, I'm a supporter. I, I know. I, I mean, you know. Personally, I think a little differently, but that's okay. <laughs> Please. Just to uh, clarify, it, Apple Pay made some consumer promises. So they took the NFC, the contact, which was just you know well known, but they added the extra things in there and they listed them out. You know, the fingerprint, the, the your your account number is never in the open. We, we your transaction is private. Um, and it changes every time. So that kind of sets a new standard for as far as the consumer perception of what a wallet should be. So is there, there's nothing about HCE or any other wallet that they, could, they can um, take that, uh, replicate those claims. Um, yes, they can. Yeah, they can. So as far, as far as, you know, Apple Pay raised the security discussion for consumers to a new level. Mm -hmm. But that advantage or that preemption can be copied by other, other means, HCE. Would that be true? Yeah, I think the answer, I mean, if you're asking me. Yeah, anybody. Simple, simple okay. answer is yes. I mean, Apple, and I think Khan made, made a good point, right? Apple Pay has raised the bar on a lot of things. They make care, consumers care about security amount payments, okay? If, if you don't use the word and your, your credit card is never exposed, all of our, our, our products are now going to include that claim because nobody can have less than what Apple Pay does, okay, or they dynamic do it, data. They do it now. Google Wallet and SoftCard um, come back and make the same claims. Do they have to do some more work? No, SoftCard supports so, dynamic card data today. I want to ask you to take one more question. Yeah. So I think yeah, uh, please take it and uh, the discussion yeah. offline, please. So do you Go guys ahead. think that Apple actually made a cognizant decision of which of the two systems is better by embedding a secure element into their device? I mean, they made a conscious decision. They could do card emulation, which has been part of the spec since 2005, but they chose to add that bomb, uh, the, the cost of their bill of materials to put a secure element for a reason. And in fact, they even marketed as such in their marketing documents where they go out of their way to say, we have this dedicated secure element. So they made a choice yeah, to do one over the other. Yes. I think Somebody wants to answer that control. question. Why, why would they take a better approach? I know, uh, Jeff, you can answer that question. To raise NXP's sales <laughs> control. in 2014. Good job, good job. <laughs> Mission accomplished. Yeah. There's a win for one and the lose for other. So <laughs> let's, let's start with the Sebastian on. I mean, these guys know what they do, right? <laughs> they, they looked at their options and, and they went for something, as I said at the beginning of this uh, panel, 
that is secure, that is known, that is robust, that is proven. Now, they could have tried to reinvent the wheel, but if it's there, it's available, it's affordable, and it's reliable, why would they do Candid, something else? I got a few seconds. Candid answer from the neutral party yeah. between the both, Brian and... I think and they did that purely to control the uh, consumer so that they have to stick with that product as long as possible, make it as difficult to choose a competing product. Wow. One uh, last statement. <laughs> Dude. One last statement, Hans. Okay. And then we I think it's very simple. They did not want to get in the liability between merchants and banks. By picking a secure element that everybody knows liability on, they step away from the liability and they just become the plastic card. Great. Good ending. Good. Thank you, folks. Thank you.